Let's turn in the Word of God this morning to the if John's first epistle and the chapter 3. John's epistle, first epistle, and chapter 3. just want to thank John for his warm words of welcome. It's nice to be back with you again today in the lifeboat, and trust the Lord might bless us again today as we look into his Word. First John, chapter 3, and commencing at the verse number 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Move down to the verse number 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth." And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him, and hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Keep your finger in that passage and just one verse. Uh, from Hebrews chapter 12 and the verse number 14, which really is the basis of our uh, message this morning, verse four, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. The Lord. Let's just bow for a word of prayer. Let's ask God to prepare our hearts to speak to us now from His Word. Lord, we thank Thee once again for the privilege, the joy it is to be here in the house of God, here around the things of God, to worship Thee, to center our minds and our hearts upon Thee, to try and shut out the things of the world and the things that would uh, drag us away from Thee and and rich fellowship and communion with Thee. Lord, just to have our hearts caught up with Thee now, Lord, I ask Thee to speak to us from Thy Word. We thank Thee for the truth of God in these days in which we live. We thank Thee for the Word of God and what it means to us as Thy people. Lord, speak to us now. I pray, O God, that Thou hast put Thy finger upon areas of our hearts and lives that need dealt with today. We ask, Lord, that the Holy Ghost might have His way within all of our hearts. And Lord, for those amongst us who still do not know Thee, Lord, who are still strangers to Thy grace, Lord, apply Thy truth so powerfully to their hearts this morning that they might not be able to leave this place until they cast themselves at the feet of Christ and know what it is to be born from above. Lord, anoint me afresh now with the Holy Ghost I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Scripture makes it very clear that every true child of God cannot lose their salvation. 
Their salvation in Christ is eternally secure. We belong to Christ forever. And that's a truth that every child of God ought to know and to enjoy and to rejoice in from day to day. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 19, the Apostle Paul wrote, "...the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His." God has a rock-solid foundation, and we are on that foundation this morning, uh, those of us who are saved. And not only are we on that foundation, but we are sealed on it. And when God has sealed, no one or nothing, folks, can ever, ever break. The Lord knows that we are His. John 10, 27 to 28, those well-known words of Christ, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Christ's great high priestly prayer in John 17 and verse 2, praying in regard to his people, Christ said, Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost. Philippians 1 and verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, will complete it, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And isn't it a wonderful truth, comforting truth, as we travel through life, as we face the uncertainties of life and all that comes against us from day to day? Isn't it wonderful as the people of God to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that great saving purpose of God that He has begun within our hearts and lives, that He will carry that purpose on to completion. And absolutely nothing will cause that purpose of God to save us completely. Nothing will ever cause that to fail. So the assurance that we belong to Christ forever, that we cannot be lost, is an assurance that every child of God should know and enjoy. The teaching that you can be saved and then lost again is a monstrous doctrine that is simply not true. It goes against so much of what the Scriptures teach. But having said that, there are two sides to this coin. That verse I just quoted from 2 Timothy 2 and verse 19, the the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His. It goes on to say, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So the one side of the coin is that we are sealed on God's foundation. The other side is because we name the name of Christ, we will depart from iniquity. All who truly belong to Christ and have eternal life it will be the prevailing habit of their lives to depart from iniquity and to live holy, godly, and separated lives. Follow holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Don't you talk about being saved and still living like the devil. Unless you are actively pursuing a life of holiness godliness and Christ-likeness, you have no reason this morning to believe that you are saved. Not that pursuing holiness in itself is what saves us. Absolutely not. We are saved by faith in Christ alone. But we're talking here about the mark of a truly saved person. As, As someone who is truly saved and born of the Spirit of God, The distinguishing mark of their lives is that they follow after holiness, godliness, and righteousness. The teaching that holiness is some second experience that you go in for later, in other words, that is something optional, again, is not scriptural. 
There is no third class of people, namely the so-called carnal Christian, someone who has been justified but hasn't went in yet for their sanctification. Such people, friends, do not exist. You cannot separate justification and sanctification, taking one and leaving the other. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 30, it says, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Christ cannot be divided. You either take a whole Christ or you don't take him at all. And unless you are actively pursuing a life of holiness and sanctification and Christ-likeness, you have no reason to believe this morning that you are truly saved. Those who don't believe in the doctrine of eternal security, uh, the, the eternal security of the believer, they often uh, bring as their main charge against this doctrine that it gives people the license to sin and, and live as they please. Sure, I'm saved, I'm eternally secure, therefore I can live as I please, I can, I can do what I want. That charge is based on ignorance, but it still needs to be refuted. The truth is, folks, that the Scriptures teach the final perseverance of the saints, not those living like the devil, those living in deliberate, willful sin. Those truly born of God, with the life of God within them, are those who are eternally secure. And the Scripture gives us some very definite tests as to whether someone is born of God and truly possess eternal life through spiritual life. And we have some of those tests in this chapter that we read earlier, 1 John chapter 3. And three tests that I want to leave with you this morning. And as I leave these tests with you, I want you to, each of you this morning, to apply these tests to your heart and life. If you're here this morning, and I know that many of you are truly born of God, belong to Him, have true spiritual life within you, well, as we look at these tests this morning, you ought to be encouraged. I want you to be encouraged this morning that you truly are a child of God and belong to Him, that these wonderful truths, these wonderful tests that we can apply as to whether or not we are born of God, that they do apply to you. Therefore, you can take heart. You can be encouraged. You can go forth and face the difficulties and pressures of life knowing that you are a true child of God and belong to Him. But perhaps there are some amongst us this morning. Maybe you're hiding behind some false profession. Maybe you profess to be saved. You can look back perhaps at some time when you maybe prayed a prayer or made a response in a meeting somewhere. But maybe this morning, you're not truly born of God. These tests that we have here that we're going to look at just now, I trust that you will apply them to your heart and life. And if these tests show this morning that you're not born of God, not truly saved and belonging to Him, it's my prayer that God will use His Word this morning, even in your heart and life, whether you be young or old. God may bring you to an experience, even this day, of true repentance and salvation and finding Christ and eternal life and truly belonging to God. Let's look at these three tests that we can apply to know whether or not we are truly born of God. The first is, the first test is the person who is born of God is a person who has the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. And the, the verse there is the verse 24 of 1 John 3, where it says, And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. If we are true children of God, it means that we are in him and he is in us. And the proof that we are in Him and He is in us is that we have the Holy Spirit. He has given us His Holy Spirit who dwells within us. 
This is what differentiates the true believer from the mere professor. Christ, in explaining the new birth to Nicodemus there in John chapter 3, he said these well-known words to him, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That means fleshly, carnal, controlled by the flesh and sinful desires. And folks, that is our condition by nature as we are born into this world. We are born fleshly, carnal, controlled by the flesh and sinful fleshly desires. But Christ went on to say, and that which is born of the Spirit is spiritual. It is spirit, is spiritual, is controlled by the Spirit. Folks, to be born of the Spirit is to be a spiritual man, is to be following holiness, not sinful, carnal, fleshly desires. We are altogether different this morning from those who are not born of God. We're not just a little bit different here or there. We haven't just turned over certain new leaves. We haven't just changed certain ways of going. No, we are absolutely and fundamentally different from those who are not Christ this morning. They are still in the flesh, still controlled by sinful, selfish desires. But for those of us who are saved and born of God, we are controlled by the Spirit of God. We are spiritual as opposed to being fleshly. There is this fundamental difference. We are radically different. We have been made partakers of the divine nature, as Peter puts it. Folks, isn't that staggering to think this morning? That when God reached down and saved you, he made you a partaker of the divine nature. God put something of his own life and nature within you. That's how you are this morning. We, ought to, we, we should be pursuing holiness. That's what makes the Christian different from the non-Christian. You may ask this morning, well, how do I know that I have the Spirit? How do I know that the Spirit of God dwells within me? But again, there are a number of things in the Word of God that uh, tests and need that we can apply to our hearts so we uh, can know that we, are, that we truly have the Spirit of God within us. Firstly, if the Spirit dwells within us, we will be conscious of His power dealing with us and working in us. We'll be conscious of His power dealing with us and working within us. Philippians 2, 12 to 13, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God by his Spirit is working within us. If we have the Spirit of God this morning, the Spirit of God is working within us, and we are conscious of that working within us. Folks, are you conscious at times as you sit under the preaching of the Word of God or perhaps as you're reading the Word of God by yourself, are you conscious at times of the Spirit of God taking precious truth, applying it to your heart, maybe putting His finger on some area of your, of your life that's not in line with the Word of God and you feel uneasy about it? and He deals with you and, and brings those truths before you, and, and you feel a need to put those areas right in your life. When you're tempted to have wrong thoughts or attitudes, to gossip and criticize and complain, are you conscious of the Spirit prompting you to say no to those desires? You see, that's the Spirit's work within us. And if you're born of God this morning and you have the Spirit within you, then that is His work, and you'll be conscious of that work in your heart day by day. The Spirit of God working in you and dealing with you. Secondly, if the Spirit dwells within us, we will find ourselves having a deep interest and desire for spiritual things. 
We find ourselves having a deep interest and desire for spiritual things. Romans 8 and verse 5, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. The worldly, fleshly man this morning, he desires the things of the flesh, the world, the pleasures, the things that he can get in this world. The man or the woman who has the Spirit of God dwelling within them is a man or a woman who desires spiritual, heavenly, and eternal things. I don't care what profession of faith you might make this morning. If there's not the evidence in your heart and life of a desire for heavenly, spiritual, and eternal things, then I would seriously question your profession of faith. This is a mark of having the Spirit of God within you. You desire, you want spiritual things. You want to be in the house of God. You want to be around the table of the Lord. You want to be in the prayer meeting. As you look out in the state of the nation, you want to be on your knees crying to God because this is where your interests and your desires really lie. Spirit within us gives us those deep longings for spiritual things. Not the fleeting, passing, temporal things of this old world, but the spiritual things. We'll be conscious of His working within us to give us that deep interest in the things of God. Not just a little duty to read my Bible and come to the house of God and even come to the prayer meeting. No, it's the greatest longing and desire of my heart to do so, to follow holiness. You see, it's the Spirit of God within us that creates those desires. A person who is not truly born of God finds spiritual things boring. Maybe you're here this morning, you find services like this boring, listening to preaching and, and people praying and, and singing Perhaps it's boring to you. Maybe you're here just because your parents bring you or whatever. My dear friend, if these things are boring to you, oh, I pity you this morning. I believe that you're void of the Spirit of God within you. For folks, for every one of us in this meeting this morning that has the Spirit of God within us, we love to be in the house of God. We love the things of God. We love the place of prayer. We love the interests of the kingdom of God. The Spirit dwells within us. Not only will we be conscious of His power dealing with us and working in us and giving us a deep desire for spiritual and heavenly things, but thirdly, if the Spirit dwells within us, we'll feel conviction of sin. We'll feel a sensitivity to sin. Thomas Briggs, one of the old Puritans, said, A holy man knows that all sin strikes at the holiness of God the glory of God, the nature of God, the being of God, and the law of God, and therefore his heart rises against all. If you're truly saved and have the Spirit of God dwelling within you this morning, whenever you're dishonest about something, you'll be troubled about it. Whenever you gossip and slander, you'll feel troubled. Your, your, your conscience will be pricked. It will grieve you, not simply because you have done something wrong, but no, because you'll know that you have sinned against the love of God. You have committed something that caused Christ to be nailed to Calvary's cross, something that caused him to suffer, to bleed and to die there. Why? Because sin is something that's heinous to God. You'll feel conviction because that's the Spirit's work. But fourthly, if the Spirit dwells within you, you will also produce the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 to 24, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. The Spirit of God truly dwells within our hearts this morning. Folks, the fruit of the Spirit will be evident in our lives. 
It's got to be. The fruit of the Spirit, these fruits that we just listed here, they'll be evident in your life. There will be that hatred of sin. There will be that desire for holiness. The Spirit of God dwells within us. Not only will we be conscious of His power dealing with us, giving us an interest in spiritual and heavenly things, causing us to feel conviction of sin, producing the, the fruit of the Spirit within us. But fifthly, if the Spirit dwells within us, we will also have the, that spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself, that Spirit of God dwelling within us, will bear witness with our spirits that we belong to God, that we're the children of God. Do you have that sense within you this morning that you're a child of God, that He is your heavenly Father, that He's made you His child? Is there that de deep desire within you to, to please Him, to live in conformity to His will, just like a child will seek to please its parents because they know that their parents love them? Is there that deep desire within your heart this morning to live a life that pleases God, not, not out of a sense of duty, but because you know and sense the love of God, your heavenly Father to you, that He's made you His child, therefore you want to please Him? Folks, these are the tests that we can apply. These are the things that differentiate the believer, the true believer, from the mere professor. The true believer has the Spirit of God dwelling within them. Luther said, a Christian must necessarily be a partaker of the Holy Spirit and lead a new life. And if he does not do that, let him know that he has no part in Christ. We must make sure, folks, that we are not what the Puritans called gospel hypocrites, those on their way to hell. For folks, the Word of God is still as true as ever it was from our text this morning. Follow holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Are you pursuing holiness this morning of heart and life because you know that the Holy Spirit himself dwells within you? Another test as to whether or not we are born of God and possessed through spiritual life is that we love the brethren. We love the brethren. Read there in verses 14 and 15, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Folks, a final positive proof that we have truly been born of God is that we will love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Loving our brethren is a part of that holiness without which we will never see the Lord. Folks, that is challenging this morning. Challenging. Notice that the apostle doesn't say that we necessarily like our brothers and sisters in the Lord. A liking for something or, or someone is something that's biological, and we don't have any control over that. We're not required to necessarily like all our brothers and sisters in the Lord, but we are required to love them. A person truly born of God has received a new nature within them, and that new nature is one of love. The Holy Spirit has given us this new nature, and one of the fruits of the Spirit is love. We have been born into the family of God, and so it's natural for us to love the members of the family. And folks, as we look around at churches and at groups of God's people, as we see them at loggerheads with each other, Sometimes we have got to seriously question, do they all have the Spirit of God within them? For the Spirit of God in me, 
that has made me a child of God and made me a member of his family will never fight with the Spirit of God in you that has made you a child of God and a member of his family. Never. Why is it natural for us to love our brethren? It's because we see the same grace of God in their lives as we see in ours. The only thing that has made you and your brother in the Lord, both members of the family of God, brought you into that family, is his sovereign grace. That grace of God that reached you wherever you were in your sin, whatever condition you were in before you came to the Lord, that same grace of God that reached you there, is what has reached your brother and sister sitting beside you this morning. And folks, we love our brothers and sisters in the Lord because of the grace of God that we see in their lives. Not for the faults or anything else that we see in them, but because of the grace of God that we see in them. There may be many things that we don't like about them, but we love them for that grace of God that we see in their lives. You see, we're all God's workmanship this morning. God is the one who has laid hold upon us, brought us to himself, made us members of his family. He's working in us by his sovereign grace. He's conforming us all into the image of Christ. That sovereign grace that reached and saved you is what a, this, this same grace that has reached every brother and sister that you have in the Lord. You know, if we were to focus upon that instead of the faults that we see in each other, how much more unity there would be amongst the people of God. It's also natural for us to love our brethren because we share the same interests. We have all been brought out of darkness into light and so are interested in and share in spiritual, heavenly, and eternal things. We all love the Word of God and the cause of God and the cause of Christ. We may have different opinions on things and and, on some matters, but folks, we all have that same interest in spiritual and heavenly things. We love the Word of God. Our ultimate interests are in the kingdom of God. And folks, we're all heading for the same ultimate destination. We're all heading together for God's glorious heaven, where we will spend our eternity together as the people and the family of God. Folks, if those are not reasons why we should love each other, then I don't know what other reasons there would be. We have that same blessed hope within us. We know that when the trumpet will sound one day and Christ will come again in all of his glory, that we're all going to be together with Christ in his heaven forever, in the everlasting glory. We all share that same blessed hope. So therefore, we should love them as brothers and sisters in the Lord. There's a proof, there's a test as to whether or not we have uh, been born of God and born into the family of God, we will love our brothers and sisters in the Lord. But thirdly, third test as to whether or not we are born of God is that we will hate sin and we will love holiness. We will hate sin and we will love holiness. Verse 2 and 3 of 1 John 3, it says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. The person who is born of God hates sin and wants to purify himself from sin. Why does he hate sin and want to purify himself from it? Merely because it makes him feel miserable and unhappy? No, he hates sin primarily because he knows that that sin robs God of the glory that he should be receiving from them. He cries out with the hymn writer, I hate 
the sins that made thee mourn and drove thee from my breast. The reason why the child of God hates sin is because they know that it's sin that grieves the Spirit of God, that causes him to withdraw from them as it were. Someone has said, if I hate sin, I am entitled to conclude that I am a child of God, for no unbeliever ever yet hated sin. Look at the world this morning. Do they hate sin? No, they love it. That's why they're so uh, mad and, and following after it. They love it. They love the pleasures of sin. As the children of God, we hate sin. And because we hate sin, that's a proof positive that we are not any longer unbelievers out there in the world, but we belong to God and have His Spirit within us. Follow holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Do you hate sin this morning? Is it the one thing you hate above everything else? Do you pursue holiness? Do you love the pursuit of holiness? Is it the greatest pleasure to you to, to, to deny yourself those pleasures, those temptations that come your way from day to day? Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, if you are not holy, you are not a Christian. If you claim to love Christ and yet are living an unholy life, there's only one thing to be said about you. You are a bare-faced liar. Follow holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Folks, that's the New Testament standard. Not that I have said or any other preacher the God himself has laid down. Pursuing holiness, because if you're not, if that's not the, the thing that you live for and are aiming for and pursuing after with all of your being from day to day, it's just a proof that you do not belong to God and you will never, ever see the Lord. Every man that hath this hope in him, says John here, purifieth himself even as he is pure. Having the hope, the context here is of the, uh, the second coming, we looked one night in the prayer meeting at this, the, the great hope that we have of Christ coming again, that great hope that every child of God has in this old world in which we live when things are getting more depressing by the day. We have that great and blessed hope that one day soon Christ is going to come, he's going to step in, he's going to deal with this old wicked world. But having that hope within us, John tells us, leads us to purify ourselves even as he is pure. The sure and certain knowledge and hope that one day soon I am going to see Christ in all of his glory. I'm going to set my eyes upon my blessed Redeemer and see him as he is and spend my eternity with him. That hope leads me to do but one thing, that is to pursue holiness, to purify myself even as he is pure. Are we to strive and sweat and pray in order that at the end we might make it to heaven? No. But it's because we have that hope, because we know that we belong to Christ, that we're his forever. It's because we know that, therefore we strive to live a holy life. It's by the grace of God alone that we know that we're destined for heaven. Not anything in us, not even our pursuit of holiness is our hope of heaven, no. But by the grace of God alone, we know we're destined for heaven. And knowing that, we pursue holiness. We prepare for going to heaven. We know we're going to be there in heaven, so we prepare for going there. We cleanse and purify ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. We perfect holiness in the fear of God. We have received the nature of heaven within us. That's what we have. Child of God, you have the very nature of heaven within you this morning. And how is heaven? Heaven is a pure and a holy place. There is no sin in heaven. 
all the filth that we see around us in these days, folks, it's absolutely absent from heaven. It will not be there. Only perfection and holiness and purity. And because we live in this sinful world with all this filth and evil around us, with the nature of heaven within us, the only way that we can possibly live in this world is to pursue holiness with all of our might and mien, knowing that one day when we leave this old sinful, filthy world and all of its sin, all of its rebellion against God, we're going to dwell forevermore in the house of the Lord where there's no sin, where there's nothing but holiness. And so it's inevitable that we will pursue holiness here with all of our being. Psalm 42 and verse 7, it says, Deep calleth unto deep. The depth of the holiness and purity of heaven calls to the depth of that new and holy nature that you have within you this morning, and that new nature within you responds, yes, I will pursue holiness with all of my being. John didn't say here that every man that hath this hope ought to purify himself, but he says he does purify himself. It follows as the night, the day. Do you love holiness and hate sin this morning? Do you? Someone has said, show me someone who hates sin, and I will show you someone who loves holiness. Is that you? This is a clear test as to whether or not you're born of God. Do you hate sin? Is it the most heinous thing to you? Do you love what God loves, holiness and righteousness, what is pure and godly and clean? Do we have the Holy Spirit within us? Do you have the Spirit of God within you this morning? Do you love the brethren? Do you hate sin, love holiness? Follow holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Child of God, be encouraged this morning. These tests, after applying them to your heart and life, you know that you're truly born of God. Go forth and live for God. Forsake the vanities of this old world, the things that are, that are passing away, they're valueless, they're worthless. Follow after holiness with all of your being. If you're here this morning and these tests you've applied to your heart, you discover that you don't have the Spirit of God within you. You're not conscious of His working in you. You're not conscious of His giving you desires after the things of God. These, these things that we're looking at are just totally boring to you this morning. Oh, that God would come to your heart. You might realize that you're still not saved. In spite perhaps of some profession you may have made, God, by His grace, bring you this morning to the place where you cast yourself upon Christ, where you know what it is to be born of the Spirit of God, to receive the life of God within you. Start on your way to heaven. Start that pursuit of holiness that will end someday in the everlasting glory in heaven itself.